Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this uh, seminar on uh, long-term effects of COVID-19 uh, pandemic on domestic resource mobilization in sub-Saharan Africa. My name is uh, Morten Bøos. Uh, I'm a research professor at uh, NUPI, and I'm also together with uh, Olga Helge Fjellstad, one of uh, the, we are co-sharing the TaxCap Dev Network. Uh, this is a network concerned with uh, research, uh, research on uh, on tax and dom domestic uh, resource mobilization, in particularly but not exclusively in Africa. And we have a website that you uh, that we would welcome you to have a look at. In this seminar, we're going to Odd Helge will uh, present. Um, um, a study that he has written uh, on the effects of COVID-19 on uh, domestic resource mobilization in sub-Saharan Africa and the economic um, impact that this will have. Uh, and uh, I very much look forward to this presentation. I should also say that Odd Helge Fjellstad is uh, he's a professor at uh, both the Christian Mikkelsen Institute in Bergen and also a professor at the African Tax Institute. We will uh, take uh, questions um, during this uh, webinar, so please use the Q&A function in Teams. Uh, post your questions uh, as we go uh, along. Uh, some of these questions may be woven into the conversation, so other will take uh, at the end. But please start using the Q&A um, functions uh, the moment that you have any questions. Um, we will do that in, in the way that you pose your questions uh, questions, and uh, I will read them out loud so to make certain that everybody are on track when we come or comes to the q and I'm not going to say that much more uh, right now. I uh, think I will, I will probably be tempted to join the discussion uh, after the um, presentation by Odd Helge. But for now, um, I would very much like to give the floor to uh, my uh, colleague uh, Odd Helge Fjellstad from CMI in Bergen. So Odd Helge, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Morten, and thank you for inviting me to give the seminar on a topic which I think many of us are interested in and, uh, and which will also have the, the pandemic will certainly have major impacts, not only on the tax regimes, but on many other aspects of the economy and uh, societies in developing country, as we have also seen uh, in our own country. Um, I will, I have structured my presentation as follows. Um, first, uh, shortly about uh, taxation in sub-Saharan Africa before the pandemic. Thereafter, what happened during the pandemic and what measures countries were taken and or not and so on and thereafter uh, uh, what what is the status now what is happening now after the pandemic and finally um, also with reference to the addis tax initiative which commits donors to support uh, the development of Tax building tax systems in developing countries. I have just some small uh, suggestions on how donor also can contribute in this post in the in the post pandemic phase. Taxation uh, before the pandemic. Well, actually, the situation was that countries in sub-Saharan Africa were relatively efficient at collecting revenues. According to the um, World Bank study from uh, 2019, uh, the, the sub-Saharan countries experienced the largest increase in tax revenues across the globe since 2000, although the average still remained low. And the IMF states that sub-Saharan countries are not on average showing higher levels of inefficiency in their tax collection effort than other regions once efforts of structural factors are considered. In other words, relatively efficient tax collecting systems in sub-Saharan Africa at the national level compared to other developing regions. Uh, the sub-national or local government tax system, they that's a different story. Many sub-Saharan African countries, they have actually also a, 
relatively progressive central tax system. I come back to that. Uh, but the growth in tax to GDP ratio growed very modestly and slowly over the period 1987 to 20, 2018. Um, on average, uh, tax to GDP ratios during these three decades by 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 percent per year. So keep that in mind. It's a modest and slow growth. And as I mentioned, many sub-Saharan African countries, they have relatively progressive central government tax. That may surprise many, but uh, the case is that half or more of total domestic revenues, they are typically collected from large taxpayers, a small group of large taxpayers, where revenues from corporate income tax, personal income tax from uh, the staff, employees, value added tax and so on are collected. In Tanzania, there are about 500 large companies which contribute to the bulk of the total tax revenues, the same in Uganda. And in Senegal, 15 companies account for 75% of total revenues at the national level. So being such significant net contributors to the public revenues, national tax systems are therefore relatively progressive. Although we also know that some large companies, including multinational companies, enjoy substantial tax breaks in the form of exemption, both legal and illegal exemptions. Here is a graph showing the uh, development of the tax to GDP ratio in selected countries in East Africa, Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania and Uganda for the period 87 to 2018. And you see it's very slow, uh, modest growth around 0.1% yearly. Um, and this, 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 uh, rev this graph include, includes both uh, tax revenues and revenues from natural resources. On average for these four countries, Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania and Uganda, uh, tax to GDP uh, ratio grew by 4% 4, 4 over this 30 year period. But still you see it is relatively small. Only, only Kenya has a tax to GDP ratio above 15%. Uganda, it is around 12% uh, in 2018. Tanzania, 13% of tax to GDP ratio, compared to the average for OECD countries around 33%. If you look at the selected so-called fragile state, Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger and Somalia, also the, the growth was very modeled, modest over the period. But uh, the, over the whole period, the 30 year period, the average revenue to GDP growth was for these countries was around 6% over this, this period. If you look at the grants in the form of for, uh, official development assistance, we see that there has been a major decrease in, in, in uh, uh, aid to both these African and the fragile states over this period. So in 2018, uh, on average, foreign aid contributed around 3% in fragile states and the East African countries less than 1%. So tax revenues is actually the major revenue source for most African countries, in particular, the more stable countries like those in, in East Africa. So that was the case before the pandemic. Now, what happened during the pandemic? Well, the, the pandemic had impacted on the economies through three main channels. First, there was a drop in production, which resulted from lockdowns on business operations. 
Second, the pandemic led to a decrease in household incomes as lockdowns reduced the demand for goods and services. And third, disruptions of global trade affected that affected commodity prices and exports and tourism and investment also had major impacts on the economies. And the IMF projected that uh, government revenues, they dropped by 2%, 2.3% of GDP in Sub-Saharan Africa as an average figure in 2020 compared to the pre-COVID projections. But of course here there are big large country variations depending on the economic structure, the openness of the economy, whether they are research uh, based or tourism based. And we also know that the policy responses across countries, including tax, tax reliefs to, to businesses, varied markedly. For instance, Kenya reduced the corporate income tax rates from 30 to 25% in 2020. And Kenya also reduced the VAT rate from 16% to 14%, while Tanzania, neighboring country, hardly imposed any measures, which we now see has had quite negative impacts on the business sector and revenue uh, collection in Tanzania, more than what we see have seen in, in Kenya. Uh, the pandemic's largest impact on economic growth so far has been in tourism dependent economies, to some extent also in, uh, in uh, oil exporting countries, particularly West Africa. But Tanzania, uh, in Tanzania, which is uh, has a large tourism sector, the gross domestic product growth fell by from 5.8% 5, 5, 5 in 2019 to 2% 2 in 2020. And recall, Tanzania has been flagged over the last decade as one of the countries with the highest uh, GDP growth um, in the world, around 7%. Uh, before 2019. And also per, ca per capita growth in Tanzania turned negative for the first time in 25 years in 2020. The tourism sector uh, pro is, was projected to lose 77% of its projected revenues in fiscal year 2020 to 21 and lose 50% of direct jobs. And tourism sector is a major employer in, 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 in Tanzania, uh, in the formal sector in Tanzania. And then on top of that, you have all the uh, businesses, enterprises that supply services, food and so on to the, to the tourism sector, which also has been severely affected. And when it comes to the fragile countries like Mali, Niger, uh, countries which Morton is very familiar with, uh, where initially the state had limited capacity to carry out vital governance functions, such as security and provisions of ba basis, basic services, the ex they experienced a very strong decline in growth as the pandemic aggravated the uh, drivers of fragility. Here is a graph showing how this is average figures for Sub-Saharan Africa on uh, drops in fiscal expenditure and revenues. The left part of this, uh, this um, graph show expenditure and you see in particular the pandemic had huge impact on capital expenditure, that's investments. And when it comes to the revenue side, we see that uh, the, the pandemic had major impact on, on tax revenues, on uh, on uh, on trade related to trade, including uh, tourism. So moving on to taxation after the pandemic. Well, we are not through it, and uh, but uh, and we see that there are big challenges now with rising levels of uh, contaminated people in in many African countries. But vaccination is gradually being rolled out. Uh, also, I spoke with a colleague in Tanzania today and uh, now it seems to move relatively fast in Tanzania, the, the, the vaccination degree, but they have they started uh, from a, a situation where actually former 
President Magufuli denied that there was any COVID anymore in Tanzania. No problem. In con so, so Tanzania started very late in imposing measures in contrast to Uganda and uh, and uh, uh, Kenya, for instance. Uh, but for poor countries which already faced significant underfunding of their S sustainable development goals, the pandemic has both increased the need for more revenue and made its domestic resource mobilization more difficult because of the struggle, the the the, the, the challenges in the private in the, in the in the private sector, the businesses. Um, so the pandemic had reduced revenues uh, and at the same time there has been over time a falling aid to recipient country GDP ratios. So there is a need for domestic revenues. Uh, all studies here which uh, I have gone through and including my own is that collecting more revenues is possible, but IMF position that increasing the tax to GDP ratio by five percentage points by 2030 is a reasonable aspiration. It's highly was unrealistic before the pandemic and it's even more unrealistic now. And it's quite interesting if you read uh, IMF uh, reports now uh, on their recommendations for uh, uh, on, on tax reforms and so on. Now, after the pandemic, there are more or less blueprints on their recommendations before the pandemic. So uh, in, in the work I've done with Ole Terkelsen, my Danish colleague from Danish Institute of International Studies in Copenhagen, we argue that much more realistic projections should take into account that revenue to GDP per year in many countries in sub-Saharan Africa increased by modest 0.1 to 0.2 percent of the over the period 87 to 28. You recall the, the graphs I showed you earlier. And uh, we argue in our study that future revenue increases, uh, future revenue increases will will come from gradual improvements in taxing of a range of sources. Uh, plus fewer exemptions and subsidies. There are no big bang solutions. Um, we also argue that uh, major redistribution through domestic taxation is unrealistic in poor countries with revenue to GDP ratios below 30, 15%. In South Africa, there is it's one of the few countries which where they argue the government argue that redistribution is important now, taxing the wealthy and so on. But South Africa has a tax to GDP ratio around 25%. So it's a different league than, uh, than most of the low income countries in Africa with very low uh, tax to GDP ratios. Uh, and it is also important to emphasize that there is no strong organized political support for such redistribution in most sub-Saharan Africa, African countries now, except from, for instance, well, in particular South Africa. The top political issues for policymakers are firstly related to economic development, creation of jobs, health, education, uh, roads. Second, uh, governance, anti-corruption and the rule of law, and third, domestic security. No strong support for redistribution through taxation. And the political drive for increased revenue is often very specific, in particular relating to target companies in the extractive sectors, mining companies, petroleum companies, and multinational companies in general. While the push to tax ordinary citizens and the rich is politically sensitive and rather diffuse and weakened by tax exemptions. And here also the rich one of our people are generally very uh, well politically connected if they are not sitting in key positions themselves. So uh, even though social media are packed with tax such as time has now come to taxing the rich. I agree this is noble objectives, but un but the expectations are quite unrealist, unrealistic. The political economy issue, the power, uh, power, uh, how power is, uh, how the countries are ruled, who are in power, is actually 
talking against such uh, a development. So, uh, the barriers to broader public engagement for domestic resource mobilization remain substantial in, in many countries. There is also a limited trust in governments and tax authorities, especially in fragile states, which undermines the potential for constructive tax campaigning. But you also see differences, for instance, in East Africa, which I'm most familiar with, and Southern Africa, that uh, the trust in, uh, even in South Africa, the trust in tax administration has been severely undermined, in particular during uh, the period years before the pandemic, because of the SUMA the state capture and uh, exercise there. Uh, and it takes often, it, it takes a long time to build up an efficient tax administration, but it can be undermined and eroded in a very short time. SUMA managed that within three years with the South African Revenue Services. Uh, and we also see big differences between Kenya and Tanzania in, in, in this, this respect, be, mainly relate because of the way the, the government handled the pandemic and how they uh, imposed or did not impose tax uh, reliefs on the business uh, for, for, for the business sector. Kenya had a number of tax reliefs. They had dialogue with the business community of how to how to manage and so on. Tanzania had hardly anything until now. It's also a matter of fact that it aggressive revenue mobilization, which can be a result of this, that, that, that the government are so cash strapped, they need to generate revenues, that they, they use aggressive methods to, to collect more revenues, to reach the targets, which also likely to negatively affect many taxpayers who are struggling to survive. And this may again uh, further undermine the legitimacy of the tax system as well as citizens and businesses trust in tax administration and the government in general in some countries. So what then accounts for increasing tax to GDP ratio over time in sub-Saharan Africa? Well, part of the answer lies in the to, to concentrate on increasing professional motivation and modernization of tax, ad, tax administration, which also implies that the tax administration need to move into a more constructive dialogue uh, with the private sector, uh, which has been a challenge in, in, in many, many cases. There are also uh, potential um, for, for more effective collection of uh, specific taxes, for instance, excises on luxury goods and tobacco and, and, and beer, which are very extensive major consumer goods uh, in, in many countries. And uh, excises in general on luxury and tobacco and alcohol is also a, a, a progressive tax. In, in Uganda, which has a, developed the excise tax system over time, it contributes to 9% of total national revenues. And then the um, customs in general is has a huge potential here to, to become more effective. It's the, the legislation is in place. It is not that that the law is is the is the challenge, but often the implementation of the law and it's the administ tax administration which are implementing legislation. So therefore, a more effort to improve strengthen administrations are. Uh, important. And then, of course, there are big challenges with the VAT, which can also be, be handled through more effective uh, mod, uh, tax administration. When it comes to tax exemptions, that is, of course, a big challenge where some countries' tax exemptions uh, may uh, represent up to 60%, 6 percent of GDP if uh, uh, in value. That is huge revenue losses. But the political uh, constraints of addressing um, or making major inroads on the tax exemption regime is very, very challenging. This is something which the IMF has uh, addressed over the last 20, 30 years, but still we see the exemption re regimes are so are often so politicized that it's hard to make major inroads, but we keep keep pushing it still. It is important. So here are uh, 
two key questions, I think, when it comes to taxation after the pandemic. Firstly, will the urgency of increased domestic resource mobilization brought about by the pandemic motivate ruling political elites to push for more coercive collection methods to reach the revenue targets, which may generate more revenues in the short run, but which may also contribute to undermine the legitimacy of the tax system and, and more resistance for, uh, among taxpayers? Or will instead the pandemic motivate ruling elites to interact more constructively with taxpayers and establish a dialogue based on mutual understanding of the challenges? Well, this, the answer to this question is likely to differ very much between countries, uh, but the trend towards more authoritarian rule in, in, uh, in a number of sub-Saharan African countries may suggest a more aggressive approach to taxation, which again leads to more a distance here between taxpayers and, uh, and um, and, uh, and, uh, and the government. So uh, finally, uh, what are the implications for donor support to domestic resource mobilization? I decided to put this up as a, as a, as a, as a, as a slide at the end uh, when I prepare this presentation because the major bilateral donors they have actually committed through the Addis Tax Initiative, and which was uh, uh, redes redesigned and signed again by the donors for the period 2021 to 25, that donor countries sh commit themselves to scale up their support to taxation and to support tax systems in development countries. So how can that be done? Well. What we know from the pre-pandemic period is that support to domestic resource mobilization can return investments manifold if targeted strategically. There are some studies showing that one dollar in, in uh, technical assistance to tax um, administrations for instance, developing audit capacity and uh, modern tax administration modernization may actually generate tenfold 10 times as much revenues. Um, of course, the support to fragile states, which is an area, of course, Morton is the expert on, is particular challenges. We, did, we had a report we wrote for the Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, a couple of years back, building tax systems in fragile, fragile state, which Morton and I and two others quoted. We know that it is particular challenges for bi bilateral or uh, to, to enter that arena bilaterally, but engagement via multilateral organizations like the IMF, World Bank, African Development Bank, and so on, may make inroads there. And then also support to international and regional bodies may work, uh, partly also including research network like the African uh, Economic Research Consortium, building research capacity, uh, support to tax African tax administration, which uh, I ha had, uh, I was fortunate to, to participate in a panel discussion with the organized by the African Tax Administration Forum and the African Tax Research Network a couple of days back. And they have major uh, uh, programs here for both capacity building and also building research capacity in uh, the more than 30 African member countries. And then we to build legitimacy and strength and, and more constructive dialogue between the tax taxpayers or the general public and uh, and the um, and the government and tax administration it is also important here in this uh, donor should consider domestic to support domestic and international civil society organization which had have had a very big impact on on uh, addressing challenges related to illicit financial flows um, in my view i think now the time is major also that civil society organization also engages more into the domestic revenue basis, the, uh, the, the, the ordinary tax system, 
uh, including the VAT, including uh, uh, corporate in, uh, personal income taxes and so on, as well as subnational taxes. And then it is a matter of fact. Uh, we have that, that one need to hurry slowly. Uh, unfortunately, much of donors have a very short time horizon. They have to report back annually to their um, parliament on what they have achieved, the impact, but one cannot this expect major impacts in a very short time run. One has to hurry slowly here. And also recall that uh, the, the growing the revenue to GDP ratio during the last 30, 30 years testify that uh, that uh, the importance of a long term perspective for for domestic resource mobilization support. So at the end here, I just uh, have uh, pictured two publications. One is the one one uh, report by the uh, published by the um, Danish Institute for International Studies um, by Ole Terkelsen and myself. And then a few a couple of weeks back, we published uh, a CMI bri brief uh, together with the tax cap dev network on the long term effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. You can these are all you can also access them through our, our websites. So Morten, I think I stopped there and uh, say thank you. And uh, open for questions. Thank you, Odd Helge, and I um, think this was uh, extremely interesting and I still believe that we, to a certain extent, even if we should know better, there is an underestimate, one underestimates how hard Africa, but also other developing regions with weak and uh, fragile states have been hit continues to be hit and for a long time will suffer negative consequences from COVID-19. And not only with regard to higher mortality figures, health issues, uh, overburden of already very weak uh, health and medicine capacities, but also uh, on their econ economy and what effects this will have both in the short run but also in the in the medium term horizon and even in the long run. And I would very much encourage our uh, audience, do not be shy, please uh, ask questions. Um, uh, you will get replies to them. Um, but uh, just to offer a few comments myself, uh, I do think that one reason for this may be that this is probably in contemporary modern African history. If you look at previous global economic crises that has happened, like the financial crisis and so on, many of them did not affect Africa that much because Africa was not to a similar extent integrated into the world economy and it did not have the kind of, it had consequences but only for parts of society. The pandemic, the economic consequences of the pandemic is much more felt throughout Africa from the very top to, to those that lives at the very bottom of society. And this is something that we really have to take into consideration. But, we, but I think you also pointed out very well of the Helge, how this will manifest itself very differently across African countries. And we need to think about this as 52 very different countries. Not Africa is not a country. This is going to manifest itself very differently and very and, and different countries, but also countries that we do think is relatively similar will respond to this differently. So we have, one needs to both have an approach to the Africa as a whole, but also to different groups of countries, but also to individual countries, because there are important contextual differences there. Um, one thing that I would very much like you to uh, elaborate a little bit on is, for example, you use the example of Tanzania as um, where you see this enormously large impact on Tanzania as a very tourist dependent country and economy. And this means, as you pointed out, that basically people are losing their jobs. But then is the question, what happens then? Where, where are these people going? I assume that no, uh, many 
uh, the humanitarians are returning to an informal economy that they have just sort of crawled out of. And this is not only uh, happening in Tanzania, it's happening elsewhere. So if you can say something about the prospects, but also elaborate a little bit on the kind of consequences that this may have economically, but also politically and socially. Secondly, uh, I think you very uh, rightly pointed out that the, in the most fragile states, like places where, where I do most of my empirical works with uh, uh, Malian and Nigerian colleagues, that is Mali and Niger, of course, that the pandemic actually acts as an aggregator that comes on top of pre-existing and very strong drivers of fragility and the kind of consequences that this may have. We see some of these consequences already, for example, uh, both in Mali and Burkina Faso, uh, with a turn to artisanal uh, gold mining and the kind of consequences this have both for economy, for people, but also how this in, uh, in different ways has started to relate to and being an issue used by, in this case, jihadi rebels. But I would be curious to hear uh, what more you can say about this and also how this in, uh, in any way can relate to, I mean, Tanzania is also, also a mining country, for example. I don't know what kind of consequences it has, there, but it would be interesting to hear. And then, uh, not to go on for too long, I mean, when you talk about either, I think it, you put it very elegantly, when you talk about sort of the two possible pathways for, uh, for uh, regimes that are desperate for increased revenue. Either a push for more coercive tax collection, which we in a way sort of lumped together with a growing trend of political authoritarianism in at least parts of Africa, or the other way of um, a more interactive approach, a more dialogue approach, um, which perhaps, and that's my question to you, could take us, uh, could take some countries towards a broader social contract. But then the question is, how do we build legitimacy around tax? What about visibility? What do people need to see in return for paying taxes? What do we know about that? Um, I also see that we have a question now that I will take in a, a couple of minutes, but um, maybe you would like to react to my, hopefully, relative, uh, they were not minor, but, uh, you, yeah, and, uh, these are things we have talked about. I know you can uh, provide uh, provide uh, intriguing and elegant answers to them. Well, uh, <laughs> let me try. Uh, thank you so much, Morten. Um, well, what happens when people lose their jobs uh, and uh, they're living from uh, whatever they are doing in enterprises, whether they are doing small businesses or whether they are losing their jobs in 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 the formal sector. Um, well, what we see is that the informal economy is growing, uh, which is natural. Um, that is, uh, so people find ways to, in a way, cope with the challenges. They are not sitting waiting for some, some, uh, something coming from heaven, although remittances has also increased. But the, the remittances has also changed because the pandemic has also affected the countries where the uh, diaspora uh, lives and where they are sending in Western countries, Europe, uh, US, Canada and so on. So the remittances have also changed, uh, but still quite a number of people are now living an increasing number are living on remittances by maybe smaller amounts uh, than 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 before and then what we also see is that uh, that also the agricultural sector is also becoming more more important that's a way of just surviving at least in 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 the shorter to medium term so we see because in 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 east africa everybody whether they live in the in nairobi or in the big town or in tanzania in the in the cities they have a link to the to the, to, to to the rural areas so that is also a way of surviving uh, 
uh, that they have this strength, the links uh, to the to the um, uh, their home areas, and some are also moving at least temporarily back to to the rural areas. There are not much data. There are some indications on that. What we also have seen, uh, that these are these are not really robust uh, research, but there is more anecdotal kind of type of evidence that uh, that uh, in in some sectors where we in public sectors where we saw uh, that corruption was at least to some extent under control, it actually increased, has increased that also for 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 pe because people in the public sector has have now become. No, normally they have supported a number of family members. Now more family members are de becoming dependent on them because they have lost their jobs or an income. So corruption, demand for corruption to 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 uh, in, in some sector has, according to to, to some anecdotes I've come across. Uh, uh, Alex Deva he has he has some indications on that from his work in 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 East Africa, but this is this is just some kind of temp tentative thing which we need to dig more into. Um, so and the question is also since the pandemic is perceived to be also temporarily, people are not giving up on their their, their jobs and and enterprises, but temporarily they find additional or new ways to survive. So on fragile states, as that is something we still don't know so much about what is actually happening here, but we it is very likely that uh, that uh, the, the, the the competition and and conflicts between non state actors uh, who have control of some areas and 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 the government will will also uh, increase. We may actually uh, experience a major that ordinary people are squeezed, becoming more squeezed than before between the government who are demanding revenues, uh, taxes, and the non state actors here, militias and others who also demand more money from the same, same people. So this is. Uh, those who will lose are ordinary people in this situation, squeezed from both sides. Uh, then on the possible pathways, well, the account of what, how to build uh, accountability here based on dialogue and more kind of conducive relations between the private sector taxpayers and uh, and the government. That is that is an issue which is all always up on the agenda here and uh, I don't I don't think people expect again so much very much from the government uh, in, in in this situation but I think what they like health education uh, and so on okay they, they they would like to have it but they don't expect so much but security is something which is crucial here and that is in a way uh, um, that is a way to legitimize also taxation because the security situation has also been uh, become a more bigger challenge than before in many African countries during the pandemic. Thank you Odelia. I think that we now will turn to some of the questions that uh, has been raised uh, and I would like to start with two particular questions. Uh, one posed by Sigrid Jakobsen from Tax Justice Network Norway and another posed by uh, Tron Augdal. Um, start with the first of these uh, which is about what would you say are the major differences in approach that donors should have pre and post COVID-19? And then the second one is, uh, which is a challenge to you, Odelige from Sigri, is that regarding your recommendation of donors using multilateral institutions instead of bilateral support in, in the least developed countries, what are the negative effects of bilateral as opposed to multilateral? <laughs> 
So maybe you could start with these two because they both have to do with the, the uh, with the donor side of this. Yes, I think uh, the uh, well, what I hope when it is the difference between the pre and post COVID-19 donor approach is that one has learned now during the last one and a half year that one has it takes time to develop the tax system. Uh, it it is one one really need to have a longer time perspective than than the election uh, period for for the for the for the ruling party in the donor country in in the donor countries. And uh, it it's also uh, I think also. Uh, well, certainly some of the donor approaches before and after will be the same. I, I, I will say that uh, the support to tax administration was there before. Now one may decide to prioritize um, what type of support to tax administration one should give, but it was there before. There has also been uh, 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 quite an extensive support to civil society organizations and uh, to uh, to um, uh, NGOs, not so much to the business sector, which I think uh, could also strengthen the uh, the which I think also could be a change in the in the uh, in the post COVID situation that in addition to supporting the NGOs, civil society organizations, which has been very important, one is also putting more emphasis also in in building uh, um, or contributing to a more uh, uh, constructive dialogue between the government and and the business sector on taxation. Um, then when it and then, but I think the the long that one has also a more a longer term perspective now after the COVID is something which is. I think is very important, and I think the Addis Tax Initiative is actually something which can lay foundation for that. When it comes to multilateral versus bilateral uh, approach to support in and I'm uh, to support to a building tax system in low income countries, um, my argument is that in conflict ridden or fragile state, it makes sense to to give the responsibility mainly to, to multilateral agencies because this has to do with security issues. It has to do with capacity and one really needs coordination. Um, but coordination can also be a challenge. That is the minus here. If one if the bilateral or if uh, provides support or let's say Norway provides support to uh, multilateral agencies, the World Bank and um, and and uh, IMF and so on, for their uh, support to developing tax system in fragile state. Norway should also have a say in the in in what should be the priority in in this setting to influence uh, and also provide constructive critique on the design of the approaches. Uh, that I think uh, also Afghanistan has probably read, learned us that uh, leaving most of the uh, decision to the US uh, has not been very, 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 very productive in, in, in the longer term. There need to be some critical voices who have different also perspectives. Thank you, Odell. Yeah, I think I then we'll turn to a couple of other questions that you may or may not want to tackle uh, simultaneously. I'll leave that uh, up to you. Um, and you have sort of touched upon this in your uh, in parts of your uh, responses, but I don't. I, I think it uh, can be justified to have another round on, on this. Uh, the first one is from Trun Jørgendal. Uh, is simply, do you believe that the urgency of DRM will make tax administration run for uh, run quickly for revenue instead instead of taking the time to build up legitimacy and and try to modernize and make its more uh, tax administration more uh, uh, effective, but also legitimate, I suppose. The second question is from. Uh, 
Ole Otterslag fra Utdanningsforbundet, which, which basically deals with uh, the fact that the ILO, uh, I mean, talks uh, in its uh, policies and approaches to uh, talks about the importance of uh, including uh, social partners, government employees, organizations, employers organization and so on, which is uh, substantially different than including CSOs, private actors, philanthropists, etc. And that this should be present in all sectors for sustainable development, equitable social justice and progress to be possible. And then the question is, in what way, if any, is social dialogue included in strat strategies, projects and policy development pertaining DRM? And of course, again, uh, Africa is very different also in this regard. But you may want to, I know you have some views on this, so. Well, I'll tell you the challenge yes. is uh, in your hands. Yes, I think I start with the with the with the last one with uh, from Ola, um, and I, I I very much agree with you that this is uh, something which really needed to to be taken on board to involve trade unions uh, in 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 this dialogue about. Uh, taxation or a social bill, how to build a social contract and so on. There has been uh, uh, a number of uh, uh, experiences uh, from different countries where, where uh, uh, donors have supported business associations. Um, there are some experiences also from trade unions and I think that can also be, be extended. Uh, I think this 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 is something which uh, really is important when one is talking about how to build a social contract. Uh, and there hasn't been so much on that um, so far. So maybe this is something which should be taken on board uh, uh, by by donors. And uh, and um, in some cases, we have also seen that trade unions they have uh, they are they are uh, partnering. They have this sister agree or brother agreements with similar trade unions in uh, in developing countries. That may also be a, an approach. Um, but certainly in the text for development agenda, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, then when it comes to Tron uh, Jöringdals from the Norwegian Tax Administration, uh, well, I think I touch a little bit upon, upon it. What will now be the, uh, the uh, likely uh, impacts on tax administration's approaches uh, after the pandemic? It, I think it will differ between countries, but, uh, but uh, there is a danger that many countries will actually now, because of the of the urgent need to to raise revenues, that one will experience a very aggressive uh, collection method, which may, in the short run, run uh, generate more revenues, but which will undermine the legitimacy of the tax system. In South Africa, the South African Revenue Service. The, um, the the head of the of SARS, he he has actually been um, uh, an exponent of a more aggressive tax collection. Um, no, and and the messages he sends out is actually I make me free uh, really get frozen on my back here when I hear how how aggressive he is. I think one should be very clear that it's important to 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 not accept tax evasion that those people should be punished when but when one sending out general messages about very aggressive tax collection that is something which makes people also one one get scared frightened that this will not work so so um, here i think again in some, at least on a smaller scale, in some countries where donors are involved with capacity building uh, in 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 uh, in uh, tax administrations in African countries like Norway, uh, for the time being, is in 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 Tanzania, mainland Zanzibar, Rwanda. I think a part of this technical exercises which one is doing, building 
building capacity to audit more complex companies, multinational companies. A part of that exercise should also be how to establish more constructive dialogue, soft measure for enhancing compliance with Norway has actually been, which has been very important in development in developing the legitimacy of the Norwegian tax system. I think Toron, we will have, we will discuss this further. Thank you, Odd Helge. We have a couple of new questions that I think we have the time for. Uh, so uh, I think I will uh, take these two new questions that has uh, emerged uh, on the screen in front of me, and then we'll sort of start closing after you have uh, answered those two, uh, Odd Helge. The first question is from Nora. On Kanemi, uh, and the questions uh, I think it's very interesting. It concerns tax exemptions and the challenge of rationalizing in uh, ineffective uh, tax exemptions, spe specifically exemptions to donor funded projects. And here she writes according to the IMF, the medium term potential gains from taxing donor funded projects in Cameroon. Uh, in 0.6% of GDP. And in the 2019 finance law, Cameroon has later stated that donors are liable to pay tax, no longer benefit from the exemptions. However, in practice, the government faces a lot of resistance from the donor community to pay tax, despite commitments to this tax initiative to pay taxes and use country systems for reimbursements. What would you recommend for developing country tax administrations attempting to increase revenue mobilization by taxing donor funded projects? What would be your message to the donors, uh, Odelge? I think we start by this. One. Yes, that's a, it's a very interesting question, and uh, I have been in discussion uh, with donors and others for a long time on this. Actually, published a few cu couple of things on this. At the same time, donors are uh, preaching compliance. They are. Uh, and 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 criticizing the exemption regime in country, they are also very often exempted from their uh, their projects are generally exempted. Okay, one can say that okay, if no donor projects are taxed, that will the tax will be a part of the allocation to or allocate allocation of donor funded to the country. But then one is not taking into consideration that uh, this type of exemptions may also provide signals to uh, other uh, well to, to 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 the domestic taxpayers here or why should i not lobby for exemptions when here the donors are are actually exempted that is one one part of the story and second we have also seen a number of ex um, in a number of cases that that the exemptions of for instance import of goods, uh, capital goods and services uh, and so on to donor project. They have actually there has been leakages into the domestic economy. So uh, so uh, so donor uh, some donor project that actually been a kind of mechanism for 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 importing goods. Uh, into the domestic economy without and then thereby avoiding or actually evading taxes. So it's, it, there is, it's quite a complex thing. Denmark unilaterally decided a few years back to to um, to eliminate this tax exemption regime, which they benefit or which which was they, they benefited from in their projects uh, that was also a discussion in Norway, but I don't think it was implemented I'm, and I'm not updated where, whether whether Denmark still uh, has that uh, system in place. Uh, but that, that, that is something I, I, can, I, I will check. But there the is an issue and Denmark unilaterally introduced this system because they realized it created uh, problems firstly that there were a lot of leakages of tax exempted goods from their projects into the economy it had impact neg there were negative impacts on the tax revenues and it created a lot of extra workload for the tax administration which went had to go through all these exemption uh, deals and 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 uh, uh, between with the donors so the reason why I 
started to look into this was actually that some tax administration in Africa say here you have to do something with, with a donor. Uh, can, can, can you come, come up with some advice for us when it comes to donor tax exemptions because it's creating a lot of problems for us. Um, so my recommendation is now donors should also now con consider here to, to do, they, they are part of the problem actually when it comes to tax exemptions. Thank you, Odd Helge. And then we have uh, what will be the final question uh, for uh, this session, but uh, obviously this is a de debate that will continue in a number of other uh, forums, but it's uh, a couple of questions from uh, Kjetil Abelsnes from the Norwegian Church Aid. <clears throat> he asks, have countries put in place many new tax in incentives due to COVID-19 and will it be difficult to roll them back? Secondly, besides the exercise taxes, how, how do we expand the tax base in order to find a social protection? Can you say anything about the potential you see with the new international rules, such as the global minimum tax? Well, uh, when it comes to tax incentives, um, which for instance Kenya um, introduced, some of them have been rolled back, so they were temporarily. But we know, but uh, it, we always we, we know from uh, from experience that it's easier to uh, to uh, issue tax incentives, including exemption, than to roll them back. But we see that some countries have actually, from the very start, been very clear that uh, these tax incentives or tax reliefs were temporarily when they communicated that to the business sector and Kenya was uh, imposed these initiatives or tax reliefs in dialogue, very close dialogue with uh, some of the major business associations in, in Kenya. So uh, there are also experience from other countries uh, which also indicate that uh, at least uh, some have managed to, to, uh, to introduce this incentives as pre, uh, temporarily and then they are re, they, 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 they are also in practice being temporarily. Uh, when it comes to the global tax, the minimum global minimum corporate income tax, uh, I think that well, it's it's a big challenge still for 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 among OECD countries to agree on this, and a lot of resistance from uh, countries like Ireland and uh, and Netherlands and and others. Uh, um, I I I I think it's an important initiative, but I I think it will be still very 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 difficult to implement it in in the OECD country for Africa for African countries I don't think this will made make a bigger big 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 challenge and eight of the African tax administration forum are quite critical also to partly to the whole process behind it that they have not been very uh, as involved as they would like and second that they they feel that this uh, this 15 percent is something which is too 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 low uh, well that that is that that is something which they they would at least have a say on where it should be should be set so uh, for for me, this the global. This I think it's an important initiative, but it's an initiative is mainly will will be of relevance now for the uh, developed countries. Thank you, Old Helge, and uh, I think we are uh, about to close this uh, session. Now I would like to thank you very much for a uh, brilliant uh, presentation and. Uh, your uh, ability to communicate difficult and complex economic issues and questions uh, so that also uh, a stupid political scientist like myself understand it is uh, unprecedented. So uh, you really have a gift there uh, and uh, I'm certain that the audience uh, feels the same way. I would like to thank the audience for uh, very uh, interesting and uh, much to the point questions. Um, obviously, I mean, this is not the final word said, said on this issue. I mean, we are still in the, I don't think we are anywhere near to see the end of this pandemic. 
uh, and we will live with the consequences, all of us, for a long time, uh, um, for a long, long time. And as always, when bad things happen, I mean, it's uh, unfortunately, it's the poor that uh, suffer some of the worst consequences and the economic consequences will be felt for a long, long time in Africa. And we need to step up our uh, work. We as researchers together with our uh, African colleagues to try to find um, relevant and strong academic evidence and answers that can be brought into into the policy domain, whereas practitioners need to take this as serious as it actually is. So this is a conversation that will continue. Uh, we will continue to try to highlight this issue uh, in, the, in the near future, also through the Tax Capital Network. If you are interested in uh, these uh, two publications that you still see in front of you, I mean, they can be downloaded both through the CMI website, but also through the Tax Capital side that is on uh, the NUPI homepage. And um, there you will also find more uh, information about the networks and its activities. And I would uh, particularly like to recommend uh, the tax webinar series that is being run from Bergen, uh, from CMI by Odell Fjellstad and his colleague uh, Ingrid. Uh, so that's really something to uh, look out for. And by that said, once more, thank to you, Odhelge, and thanks to your audience. And stay tuned uh, for um, also for more newsletters from the Tax Captive uh, Network that is being circulated uh, through our third partner, that is uh, the Tax Justice Network Norway, and Sigrid Klabe Jakobsen and her colleagues. Uh, so uh, there is more to come on this, and we will try to continue to do both. Uh, academic work of uh, high quality on this issue that is also policy relevant. So from uh, here at NUPI, uh, thank you all and have an excellent uh, rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye.